Hi, this is Miss Linton, and this is my wonderful period two honors biology class. Say hi. Hi. Uh, it is a Friday morning, and we are excited, and we are on Raleigh's schedule. Can somebody verify what time? Is it 10 or 9.50? What time are we out? I don't have my Raleigh schedule. It's normally 9.50, isn't Okay. It? All right. Yeah. So we are going to continue on in our circulatory system, and we left off talking about, um, and we covered it, but I want to just review it a little bit about an EKG. And could I have my youngest bio buddy explain what do each one of the demarcations on this mean? What's going on there? Go. The R is the 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 Yeah, I know, but like, that's a lot. All right. I'm sorry. Um, okay, what is key? This is when you're measuring the electrical stimulus that goes across the heart, right? And what controls the heart rate? The pacemaker. Okay, I'm looking ultimately. Tell me what controls it. The brain. Where in the brain? The medulla oblongata. Totally are. Yeah, the medulla oblongata is ultimately what sends the signal to your heart, and that will hit the what of the heart that makes the heart beat, known as the pacemaker. What's that called? SA. So it hits the SA node, a wave of depolarization goes across the atria, the atria contract, it hits the AV node, goes down the bundle of his, Purkinje fibers, and the ventricles contract. And it goes atria, ventricles, relax. Atria, ventricles, relax. Atria, ventricles, relax. That change in the heart when the atria are contracting is the P wave. QRS is when the ventricles, ventricles are what? Contracting. contracting. And then the T is when the ventricles are relaxing. Where in here do I see atria relax? Um, uh, it's in QRS, yeah. When the ventricles are contracting, that's when the atria would be relaxing. Now, if this gets thrown off in some way, then you need, um, you'll, you'll see something like this. This is when it calls for the defibrillator. And basically, you're just trying to reboot the heart. Cause a major, uh, for the whole heart, with the electrical stimulus to contract, and then relax, and then hopefully reboot correctly. All right, and here you go. What is the number, you guys? One, four, two. Number, number, good. <laughs> Thank you. I said it like 10 times. Not just one time. <laughs> So this is a review from last class. How could you find out if you don't know the answer? That's right. Where are your notes? They're on your computer. Right. I can't, I can't. My large mammalian brain wins over his. He wants to eat it off her desk. That's how desperate he is. I don't know. Sadness has filled my heart, but good job, Western Bluebird. Um, so let's talk about this again. Be right here to me, to me, to me. Atria contract. Blood is going to go through what valves when the atria contract? Tricuspid and bicuspid collectively known as the AV valves, okay? So then when the ventricles contract, the ventricles are contracting, they're gonna to wanna to send blood everywhere. Part of the everywhere they would send the blood is back into the atria. 
but that is prevented by what valves? AV valves, who slam shut. And that's the first sound you hear when you hear the heartbeat, is are the AV valves slamming shut. Then as the ventricles relax, they will be sucking the blood back in that they just squirted out. What prevents it from refilling the ventricles with that blood that was just out the pulmonary arteries and the aorta? What prevents it? The semilunar valves. So then they slam shut. So it's AV semilunar, AV semilunar, AV semilunar, and that's your heartbeat. Okay? Um, check your bio buddies clicker. Do they have shame or do they celebrate? Yeah, you know what? No, no one's getting any shame. Now, come back to me. You're doing great. Love you very much. I'm already proud of you. I want to tell you our goal is to finish early if we can, because then we can start in on our lab. It'll make Tuesday when I see you next. You can just collect data and finish your lab so you don't have to do it um, outside of class. All right, that, that would be the goal. Um, and just a heads up, I'm doing the lab differently, and you're going to do it collectively and digitally. Okay? So, um, including your graphs and your data tables. Okay? But I want to have time to talk to you about it. You shouldn't have any homework over it. But then it'll be focused work on Tuesday and data collection and working on it as a team and hopefully submitting it. But I give you more time after that. Yes? So no lab notebook? No, not this time. I know, are you sad? No, thank but you. But I was planning it out. You're actually going to do a heart rate blood pressure lab on what day? Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Uh, I'm just saying. Okay. That's clever. Oh. 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 Nice, Acorn Woodpecker. Took you five seconds to fail. Okay. Look at this. Take a moment. Look at your clicker. Show it to your bio buddy right now. Did they get it right? Did we just go over this? I think we did. Okay, show your bio buddy. Did your bio buddy make it all right? Yes. I put in B, but it shows I'm wrong. I'm sorry. It really says you're right up here, though. Okay. Unless were you that one? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. <coughs> so take a look at this diagram. Let's review the parts of the heart that we already know. Do our little song here. It goes what? Arteries, arterioles, capillaries in the middle, venules, veins. Oh, we didn't do the first thing. Arteries go away from the heart, veins go towards. Arteries, arterioles, capillaries in the middle, venules, veins. Heart, body, heart, lungs. Again, heart, body, heart, lungs. Heart, systemic, heart, pulmonary. Heart, systemic, heart, pulmonary. And then atria, what do they do? <laughs> what do they do? Collect, collect and ventricles pump. Atria, collect, and ventricles pump. Okay, good. All right, now, this should be familiar to you. So I would like, please, the dark shoe bio buddy to explain this diagram. Go dark shoe one. Just think it in your head. Right here. 
Riddle me this, think it in your head, not out loud. What is the name of that blood vessel? And just think it. Tell. Aorta. Good, aorta, right? No. Because it, the left ventricle, what blood vessel leaves the left ventricle? The aorta. Then that's gonna branch into regular old <coughs> arteries and arterioles, <coughs> and then capillaries in the middle, okay? And this would be those capillaries right there. Okay, then what? Venules, veins. What would be the veins going in right here? Vena cava. Good. Okay, then we'd be going through what valve right here? Yes, and you're remembering that because rat. Okay, tricuspid valve, right ventricle. Then two items would be coming. This showing one, but you know there's two vessels. It would be the what? Left and right. Pulmonary, because we need to go to the lungs. Pulmonary, we're going away, so it's a artery. Left and right pulmonary artery, plain old arteries, arterioles, capillaries in the middle. And those capillaries are going to be going around these little teeny tiny air sacs called alveoli, where they're going to be picking up oxygen and dropping off carbon dioxide. And then you're going to come back in venules, right? Veins and what? What are the names of them? Left and right pulmonary veins into the left atrium through what valve? Bicuspid, left ventricle, and back to the aorta. Yeah? Okay. Dark shoot one, this was yours. Light shoot one, this one's yours. Go ahead, light shoot one. <laughs> circuit is everywhere else. So part of your systemic circuit is going to be going to the brain and dropping off oxygen in the brain and picking up CO2 and coming back to the heart. Part is going out to all these organs. It could be going out to muscles, right? It could be going out to glands. Um, and it could be going um, to, let's say, the kidney. Okay. If some of this, if this aorta right here branches off and goes out to your kidneys, what might be happening out there at your kidneys? Well, why do you have kidneys? Filter blood. Filter your blood. Filter your blood. Of what? Waste. Waste. Waste, exactly. And your kidneys do a lot of other important things for you as well. Um, and we'll be talking about that. Um, stimulating red blood cell formation, monitoring your pH, and that, that will come later, okay? But the big thing that you would do is, yes, they're gonna filter your blood. Um, um, so I want to talk about some of the places the blood is going to go and what happens at that particular organ. For instance, part of your systemic circuit, you will have blood vessels that branch off and actually go to the heart itself. Why does blood need to go to the heart off of the aorta? Why would that be important? What is the heart? Muscle. It's a muscle. What, does, yeah. what do muscles need? Blood. Why do they need blood? Oxygen. oxygen. They need oxygen so they can do what process? Cellular, Cellular respiration. respiration to generate what? A to what? To generate A what? <laughs> ATP. Why does the cardiac muscle need ATP? To do work. To do work. Like contract to keep your blood moving, right? You with me on that? So, sweetheart. 
So that process, okay, that's really important. That circuit that just goes around your heart, that's called your coronary circuit, okay? Where you have arteries just going to feed that heart muscle. Now, the heart muscle itself can't get what it needs from the blood inside of it. The walls are too thick. They need it to have arteries come back and branch into arterioles and then branch into what? Capillaries. 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 To feed this heart muscle right here. What happens if you have one of these arteries blocked right here? Heart yeah, you could have a what? Heart attack. And you would need to get, you know what kind of surgery you might need to get? Yes. A bypass surgery. So they might go harvest a vein somewhere and put that vein in there to go around where that clot is. If you have a double bypass, it needs to happen how many times? Twice. Twice. You have two different blockages. If you have a triple bypass, it needs to happen three, three times. Okay? That's where you're like, uh, okay, it's in there. We can't travel that road anymore, so we need to build another road around it. Okay? Because if one of those heart cells doesn't get the oxygen it needs, it might start dancing to its own tune, and then it applies a lot of peer pressure. If just one heart cell goes, I'm going to beat now instead of when everybody else does, and then it goes, you beat with me. And now there's two of us are beating off beat, right? And now three of us and four of us and five of us, and then pretty soon all of a sudden you're clear, okay? Because every the whole thing goes off. Okay, so it's critical that you feed that heart. That's one of your circuits is the coronary circuit. So let's go to your notes. Um, under the pulmonary circuit, pulmonary arteries, so I'm taking a step back, sorry, I should have done this already. The pulmonary circuit, the arteries carry what kind of blood? And do they carry oxygenated or deoxygenated blood in the pulmonary circuit? Arteries go away from the heart so when you're going away from the heart and towards the lungs, is the blood oxy or deoxy? Deoxy, deoxy good. Arteries carry deoxygenated blood, and you have an exchange of gases at the capillaries and alveoli at the lungs. And then you would know pulmonary veins carry what? Oxygenated blood. In the systemic circuit, it starts with the aorta and arteries are carrying oxygenated blood. You have an exchange of gases and nutrients and waste at the capillaries of the tissues. Talk a little bit more about that in a bit. And the systemic veins carry what kind of blood? Deoxygenated, good. And then this is where we are. The coronary circuit serves the what muscle? What muscle does it serve? Heart, Heart muscle, good. All right, so come up here for a minute. One tricky thing I'm gonna to need to explain, and it's just best if you get it right off the shoe, okay? So here you can see the heart. You can see the left ventricle. Blood that is leaving this left ventricle, it could be headed up to your brain to supply your brain. It could be headed out to any of your organs here in your body. This could be your quad muscle or whatever, and it needs oxygen, needs to get rid of CO2. As I said before, it could be going to the kidneys if you needed to and to get your blood filtered. And another spot it would go okay, is your intestines and your stomach. Why would you shunt blood, other than to keep your intestine, intestinal tissue alive, why would you shunt blood to your intestines? Does the pressure move the food? Something else I'm looking for? It can pick up the nutrients. Yeah, right? you would send and have really good vascularization around your small intestines because that's where you have the opportunity to pick up your nutrients, okay? So now, if you have just had a meal, you're gonna have a lot of nutrients in your blood and the, the capillaries going around it are gonna be picking up all those nutrients and your blood is gonna be really elevated with, let's say, sugar. Now, if that sugar then, that high sugar blood, goes back to your heart, out to your lungs, to your heart, and out to your body, that could be really bad for you, having too high of a sugar level. Yes, you have an organ, the pancreas, that makes what for you? Insulin. Insulin to help regulate your blood sugar level. But this would be obnoxiously high and can throw off the delicate osmotic balance at the capillaries. You could have like a seizure as a result. 
So what your body does, this is an amazing adaptation. When it leaves your intestines, instead of going right back to the heart like everything else does, it makes a little detour and it goes over to your liver. And it goes through another set of capillaries. So now we're going artery, arterial, capillaries in the middle, arterial, capillaries in the middle again, then venual vein. And what it does at that second set of capillaries is if the sugar level is too high, you know what your liver will do? Pull it out and store it. Remember way, way, way back, 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 unit one, we talked about carbohydrates. What's the monomer? Sugar. Well, what did we use as an example? Sugars, but glucose. what was it? Glucose, glucose, right? And then we talked about monosaccharides and we talked about what? We talked about disaccharides and polysaccharides. And we said, how do plants store sugar? And do you remember how plants store, store sugar? Starch, right? We talked about starch, we talked about oils, we talked about cellulose, right, to build structures. How do we store sugars, do you remember? Before, before fat, glycogen. glycogen. And where is that glycogen? In our livers. So the blood coming from your intestine if it's high in sugar, instead of going back and jumping back into the circuit, little detour over to the liver. If it's high in sugar, the sugars will come out, come out, come out, get stored as glycogen in your liver. If your glycogen level gets all full up, so your liver says, I can't store anymore, that's when you will store it as fat, right? You'll store it as fat. Now, after you've had your meal, and you're progressing the next you know, several hours after you've had your meal, then there will be less and less sugar in that blood because you ate your meal a while ago and you absorbed all those nutrients. So when the blood still leaves the intestines, it might be coming in a little bit low of sugar. So what will your liver do? Yeah, convert the glycogen back into glucose. That sounds like to me what? Dehydration synthesis or hydrolysis? Hydrolysis, when you break up the glycogen back into what? Glucose? And you'll put that sugar into the blood. So again, your blood sugar level is just right. What if there's no glycogen in your liver? You'll be what? Hungry. You can store about a three to four hour supply of glycogen in your liver, and this is why we eat about every what? Three to four hours. Okay, you see that? Okay, so we eat a meal, the blood around our small intestines after it picks it up, takes a little detour, goes to the liver, throws out any extra sugar. The blood sugar level leaving your liver is slightly elevated in order to supply all the rest of your body with nutrients, but if it comes in a little low, the liver will throw some in. When it runs out, you get hungry. When it runs out, instead of you don't have any glycogen to burn, what are you burning? Fat, that's when you're burning fat. Okay. What, you'll go there too, depending on what you're doing. Okay, so manamana, go to where it says portal system. Takes blood from the small intestines directly to the liver, directly to the liver. So it should be going back and going right then and doing the pulmonary circuit, but it doesn't. It takes it directly to the liver. The purpose is blood nutrient regulation. Blood nutrient regulation. Okay, now look at this picture for a minute. There should be something that, that well, let me tell you first of all, here's the intestines, here's the liver. So everybody else, it's like, here you're feeding this organ and now we're gonna send our deoxygenated blood back. Here you're feeding this organ, but now we're gonna go to the liver. This right here is called your hepatic portal vein. That's the name of that vein that goes and joins the two to do the detour, okay? Um, anything liver is always hepatic. Do you know what the word is for anything kidney? It starts with an R. Renal. Have you heard of that before? Like renal failure or something like that? What's the word anything associated with the uh, lungs? Pulmonary. What's the word anything associated with your heart? Cardiac. Okay, cardiac. What's the other word? I just gave you the circuit name. Coronary. Coronary. Good. Okay, so anything liver is hepatic. So this is the hepatic portal vein, and it's feeding the liver right here. 
putting any extra nutrients. But what do you see wrong with this picture? Do you see anything wrong with this picture? There's something wrong there. Yes? Deoxygenated blood is going to the liver. Perfect. How does the liver stay alive if there is no oxygenated blood? Okay? And if you take a look here, they do this drawing like it is here to make a point about the hepatic portal vein, but what they forget to, they don't forget, but there is an artery called the hepatic artery that just feeds the liver. Okay, that just feeds the liver. They just don't usually put it in pictures because they're trying to make another point about the hepatic portal vein. But I want you to know there is an artery that goes and feeds the liver and gives it oxygen. Okay? So um, on number three, two sets of capillary beds. Two sets of capillary beds. The first is in the intestines and the second is in the liver. The first is in the intestines and the second is in the liver. We're going to see double capillaries in two more spots, in the kidney, Okay, and that has to do with filtering blood. And here in your brain, in your endocrine system, it's between your hypothalamus and your pituitary gland. So yes, it happens here, double caps, but it does happen one other place as well. Okay, um, mana, mana. Um, youngest bio buddy, could you please listen as your oldest bio buddy talks about some variations on where blood can go and why it would go there and how that would help with homeostasis. Go ahead. you to see okay this one right here the blood pressure line okay I don't know if you can tell because they're all kind of over kind of crossing over but here is the blood pressure line so it ends here it starts here okay um, what I want the youngest bio buddy to try to explain is why do we have these lines the way they are why are they jagged here smooth here do some explanation for me on why that is go ahead youngest bio buddy Okay, why the spikes? Why the spikes? Yeah, yeah, but why? That's normal. Why do we see it going up and down? Why isn't it just here's blood pressure and then it's here? What's happening? The heart's pumping. Exactly. The heart's pumping and that's why you see the surge. Okay? So your blood pressure I want you to see starts here, surge, 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 and then it ends here. If this right here is the aorta, if this were the aorta, what would this be right here? Vena cava, smart ones, very good. Blood will only move from high pressure to low pressure. If it was over here, and then it would start to move the other direction, right? So it moves from high to low. This is velocity. What is velocity? Speed, Speed. right? So we see it spiking mm -hmm. due to the heart contracting, okay? But then it really goes down. And then it comes back up, the speed of the blood, picks its pace back up. Why do you think it slows down so much? Drop off. Drop off due to the what? Uh, smaller. Small, smaller. Okay, in the capillary. So let's think about this. You have a raging river of the aorta. It branches into two rivers and then branches and branches and branches. The more it branches, the more the fluid gets friction from the, what it's passing across, right? So that would start to what it down? Slow it down. So where it has the greatest cross-sectional area, okay, would be the capillaries, exactly. Then the capillaries join back together in venules, and then veins and the vena cava, and so then it picks up its pace a little bit. Yes. How does it pick its pace back up? Because it there's less things to slow it down. It's 
It's not coming in contact with as many um, objects. So that's what makes it move. It's got the momentum behind it. Yeah. Yes. So it's like a river versus a stream. Yeah, it's, yes, it's like a river versus a stream. Exactly. So that's where we see the speed. Now, let's talk about why this is so adaptive. Where is the blood then moving the slowest? In the capillaries, where you have the greatest cross-sectional area. Where does all exchange take place? Capillaries. capillaries. That gives you your greatest opportunity for exchange because yeah. it's moving very, very what? Slowly. Slow. And then it'll pick back up and return to the heart. Okay, so on your notes. What's that bottom one? Oh, okay. So this, this line right here, the one that arches up, that's showing you total cross-sectional area. This one right here is the velocity that goes here. So it's slow at the capillaries, and then it picks back up. And then the green line is the blood pressure. Okay, so on your notes, go to where it says blood flow. Arteries. Um, in arteries, um, the blood flow is due to the force on blood by the what? Heart. Okay. The blood pressure falls. The blood pressure falls the farther the distance from the heart. The blood pressure falls the farther the distance from the heart. Okay, now I'm going to explain a big ticket item in here. I would say it's the hardest thing you're going to learn today. But it may not be that hard. See what you think? Okay. There at a capillary, there are two pressures that wage war against each other. And it's a good thing. Okay? One of the pressures says out, out, out. And another pressure says what? Yeah. In, in, in. Both beneficial, right? Think big picture. At the capillaries, what all takes place? Exchange. So I want things to go out. What things do I want to go out to myself? What's the good stuff that needs to go out there? Oxygen and nutrients. But yet, I need to take stuff around the cells that is not helpful. I need to take back what? Carbon dioxide and waste. Okay? So together, there's a little delicate balance that takes place at the capillaries that allows all that to happen. So the first thing I need to re have you remember from the slide before <clears throat> is the blood pressure is higher closer to the heart, okay, on that journey. So here I have a capillary bed here in the middle. On this end, and just hold off on all your notes and typing and just keep your eyes up here for a little bit, okay? So here's an arterial. What always comes after an arterial? A capillary. Here at this capillary bed, on the arterial end, the blood pressure is going to be higher. At the venule end of this capillary bed, the blood pressure is going to be lower. Okay? That blood pressure, when you talk about it through a capillary bed, is called hydrostatic pressure. Say that word. Hydrostatic pressure. That hydrostatic pressure on the walls of the capillary how many cells thick is a capillary bed? One. One. One cell thick, right? And you're gonna have little spaces between those cells. So when the blood pressure is like squeeze, 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 and that fluid comes in on the capillary wall, it's going to start to push fluid out between those cell walls. Now that space is not big enough for a red blood cell to get out or a white blood cell to get out, but the fluid, the plasma around those cells, it's going to get out. And what does it have in it? Oxygen, nutrients, waste, hormones, all those types of things. So here, the hydrostatic, I'm gonna call it voice. Sweetheart, you gotta sit down and just wait for a minute. The hydrostatic voice is very loud closer to the arterial end. As you progress through the capillary bed, that voice gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Why is that voice getting smaller? Because you're farther away from the heart. Hydrostatic pressure goes down. Now, that's the out voice. The in voice has to do with there's just stuff dissolved in this blood. Okay, A lot of stuff is dissolved in this blood. This is referred to as the osmotic pressure. Now, remember our words hypertonic and hypotonic? Water must flow from the hypo. So water will flow from the tissue fluid, where it's hypotonic, into the capillary bed, which is what? Hypertonic. This is the voice that says, come in, come in, come in. That loudness, okay, of that voice is about the same 
the whole length of the capillary bed. That voice level doesn't change. Same, 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 same. But at the arterial end of the capillary bed, the hydrostatic voice is louder, and then it starts to drop as you move through, and then the osmotic voice becomes loud and draws that fluid back in. So it's a way to recover. Take a look at this picture right here. Look at the arrows. And not it. Not it. One of you pick hydrostatic pressure, one of you pick osmotic pressure. Talk about what's happening. Okay, now I know that's tiny, but see if you can see right here. Make it a little bit too big. Okay, here at the arterial end, the out, out, out voice is then encouraging water and oxygen and nutrients all to come out, and that voice is the loudest, but by the time we move to the venule end, that that voice is still there, it's just quieter. And the osmotic pressure, that voice is louder, and it's saying come back in, carbon dioxide and waste water. So what you get is this flow. So at the arterial end, it's like out and recovered. Out and recovered. Now, can you see the importance of when we eat things that might change the concentration of our blood, how that could throw off that delicate osmotic balance that's taking place there? Because if you have a lot of salts in your blood, right, then the invoice is going to be very what? Loud, right? That invoice is because you have all that salts, very hypertonic, and maybe not all your cells get what they need because you have such a loud come in, come in, come in. So all of those things can change it. Whether or not the sphincters are closed on that capillary bed, that can change it. Okay, so that, that is a big deal in our regulation. Now take a look at this picture and see if you under, take a look at that picture. Take a look at this picture and see if you can use this to explain what we just talked about. Go ahead, use this picture. Can you follow it? So Okay, so look at your look at your notes and see if we've it, it's taken care of this. At the capillaries, you have an exchange as a result of two opposite pressures. At the hydrostatic end, right? What is that? What is hydrostatic yelling? Oh. Out. Okay, and this is due to the heart, and it's stronger at what end of the capillaries? Arterial. Perfect. Arterial end of the capillaries. And it forces things like nutrients and oxygen out. On the other end of the capillary bed, okay, the osmotic pressure says in, and it's due to the contents of the capillaries. It's stronger than the hydrostatic pressure at the venual end of the capillaries, and it draws waste and carbon dioxide back in. Okay, now put it together one more time. Ready? Your out voice, which push things out, may not, it will, might not be equivalent to the in voice that says come in. So now I've pushed more out than I've recovered. What's gonna happen? It's gonna be a buildup of uh, lactic acid. Not lactic acid, but a buildup of that tissue fluid, right? because I'm pushing more out around the cells than I am recovering. That could cause swelling, right, and problems. So that needs to be recovered and put back in our circulatory system. And let's go back to here. Do you see a vessel right in the middle of all of this? You know what this green thing is? Yeah, it's your lymphatic vessels. 
one of the roles of your lymphatic system is to pick up excess tissue fluid that didn't get recovered at your capillary bed and transport it and drop it back into your circulatory system and it happens at your left subclavian vein primarily. And so it recovers and returns the fluid so that our blood volume stays accurately. Do you know accurate? Do you know what it does before it returns it though? It filters it. Filters, filters it by filters. passing it through a lymph, lymph, lymph node. node. So what you can do is you can monitor the whole body just by being a lymphatic cell that hangs out at your lymph nodes. You have lymph nodes here in your neck. This is when your doctor feels to see if you're sick. Because if it's swollen, that means you have a bunch of fighters there trying to take care of whatever that is. You have lymph nodes in your armpit. You have lymph nodes along here, but you also have lymph nodes in your groin. Okay, and so they're constantly going, yeah, go ahead, you're good, you're good, you're, ah, danger. And that can, you can monitor your whole leg and the tissue fluid in that whole leg just by monitoring that lymph node. It's like a border crossing. If a wall was built, let's say, a $3.2 billion wall is built, then you could just monitor right there at the crossing to see if anything is happening, all right? So um, that is the job of your lymphatic system, and we'll be talking about that um, when we get to the immune system. So now we're ready to go back. So blood is in this venule. This venule is going to get together with a what? Venules are going to build what? Veins. Veins. So we need to go literally against gravity sometimes to get the blood back to our heart. What's going to help is there's blood behind it and pushing but it's gonna to wanna to fall back down. What prevents it from falling back down? Valves. Valves, perfect, perfect. So your, your veins are collapsible. And so when your skeletal muscle contracts, and I think we've talked about this before, when your skeletal muscle contracts, it pushes against the collapsible vein wall. And when it does that, you could get blood squirting in both directions, but it doesn't because of the valves. So if, as you're sitting, all day you sit, 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 and clap, right? That makes it hard for that vein to return. That's why it feels good if you stretch out your legs right now underneath your desk. It feels good, especially my sporty spice people, okay? Because you're getting oxygen to your muscles better. You're getting venous return better, yes? Okay. If something like you're sitting 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 and you're blocking that venous return then what happens is let's say you're crossing your legs a lot of times guys cross their legs like this right but girls like this if you're blocking you can cross however you want okay. um, if you're blocking that venous return or you know when you wear socks and you take your socks off and you have the like sock imprint okay so blood on the surface of your skin that was trying to return, it's running into the elastic of your socks. And it's like, I can't move, I can't move. And it starts to build up and they're like shoving from behind. It's like, I'm trying. And they can't get through, can't get through. And the little valve is like, and it's trying to hold. It's going, I'm doing the best I can, Captain. And then that <laughs> valve, it, it can break. Uh-oh. And now that valve breaks, and now that blood falls into the next valve down, and he's like, yes. And it all starts to fall backwards, and then it can cause varicose veins. Uh, here, I want you to see it better. <laughs> so now. Don't skip leg day. Yeah, so watch out on those tight socks because, or how you cross your legs, or sitting in the same place, move your body around, okay? So here, here are some varicose veins for you to look at. Could I please have the oldest bio buddy explain why are varicose veins caused? Go. Exactly, domino. Now, you can get varicose veins all over your body, more likely to occur in your legs for sure, 
But if you get a varicose vein in your rectum, it's called a hemorrhoid. Okay? That's what hemorrhoids are. And so what happens, yay. Okay, so sometimes they can be, Lily, I'm teaching you things. What, are you worried? Yeah. Don't be worried. I won't push, I'll tell you when I'm gonna push it. I'll tell you when I'm gonna push it. Okay, so what ends up happening is, these sometimes, I can't speak to this because I haven't had any hemorrhoids. You know I'd tell you if I had, right? But I have heard these hemorrhoids can dangle down actually out of the anus, and people are like poking them back in. So now, so what will be happening is you get out this rock. <laughs> I want to take a picture. Your teacher shows you a picture of hemorrhoids. <laughs> I moved it. Look, I moved it. All right. So, look, I'm off of the picture. Here, you like this one better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, veins. The blood flow is due to skeletal muscle contractions. That would be this picture, okay? Um, the blood flow is due to skeletal muscle contractions, pushing on venule walls, valves, and breathing movements. Varicose veins are when valves become weak and ineffective. Weak and ineffective. And then hemorrhoids are varicose veins in the rectum. Do you need to see that? No. Okay. So, um, again, they talk about like preparation H that causes it to shrink. Preparation H is a good thing to have on hand, not necessarily for, uh, not, I don't have any stock in preparation H, but if you get blisters like on your foot from something like running, you put the, hem, the um, preparation H on it and it shrinks it just like it would um, one of these uh, hemorrhoids. Do you ever see? No. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. See? Safe. All right, um, not it. Not it. Not it. Tell them two things you learned. <laughs> no. Okay. You thought that picture was bad. I had to find the picture I was going to put. Do you know when I Googled that? There are things I can't unsee. Okay? It was hideous. I literally was like, and then to top it off, it was like a dining room table kind of thing where my boys are walking by and going, Mom, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, hmm. okay, yes. So, how do you get a hemorrhoid? Okay, so. Um, it could come, a hemorrhoid could come from, I think like when you are pushing hard and nothing's happening, like constipation, I think you're more prone to get a hemorrhoid. This is why it's important to have roughage in your diet so that you have regular bowel movements, you know? If you eat like things like a lot of bread and cheese, it really makes it harder for you to have some fruit and vegetables. Is that why people, women get hemorrhoids? Yes, hemorrhoid from over that pressure, or even while they're pregnant, they're pregnant. You can get hemorrhoids, yes, and you look out for that during that whole birthing process. I think too, you know, have you seen when people are at the gym and they're like, that very now, I think that can also be lend itself, yeah. You could Google it. No, bread and cheese are good, as long as you're having vegetables and fruit, a well-balanced diet, yeah. All right. Now, moving on, let's talk about blood contents, okay? So, if you looked at your blood, if you collected it like in a vial or something, or you were a vampire, then you would see the blood like this. If you centrifuge it, then all the formed elements would go to the bottom, and then you could see the, you could see the plasma up here on top. Those of you that are anemic, you might go to the doctors and they cut the end of your finger just a little bit. They put a little tiny capillary tube on your fingertip and the blood will run into it because it's polar. They'll spin it and they'll look to see because they're gonna measure 
how many red blood cells you have. You might be low in red blood cells. These are your formed element, and then you have white blood cells. Um, and then plasma is the fluid portion of blood. Do you know what plasma is mostly made out of? Water. Water, okay. So I want to talk to you about the components of plasma and what's in it. But I need the uh, light shoot bio buddy. Just say what's in plasma. Okay, and now I'm going to teach you a way to never, ever, ever forget what's in plasma. I just want to pause for a second. Okay, welcome back. Um, now, if you go on to your notes, you will see. Blood contents, formed elements in plasma, which is over 90% water. Plasma contains dissolved gas. gases, Nutri nutrients, nutrients salts, 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 proteins, nitrogenous waste, hormones, hormones, vitamins. Good, type it in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I bet you spelled it with a W. <laughs> <laughs> Do not put bad pictures on your picture column. <laughs> you know, they monitor every computer in the school. Yeah. Yeah. And Mr. Buchanan says to me, the worst Google searches are always from your class. And I'm like, he goes, but I know they're doing biology stuff. And I'm all, yeah. <laughs> all right. Now, red blood cells. What are the job, what's the job of a red blood cell? What's the job? Carry oxygen. Carry oxygen. Okay, good. So red blood cells contain hemoglobin. Be with me contains hemoglobin and functions in oxygen transport. So when you look at this picture here, you can see all the discs. There's more red blood cells than there are what? White blood cells, good. All right, and then if we look here at a capillary, think for a minute, if I'm in a capillary, what pressure is saying things go out? Hydrostatic, what's saying come in? Osmotic pressure. If we take one of these red blood cells and blow it up, we can see it here. If you go inside that red blood cell, this is a molecule of hemoglobin. Okay? In every single red blood cell, you have approximately 250 million molecules of hemoglobin. 250 million molecules in every red blood cell. A mature red blood cell doesn't even have a nucleus. Why? It wants to make more room for what? Hemoglobin. Okay. Now, each one of these hemoglobin molecules can carry on each of these iron, right, on the heme group there, um, you can have up to four molecules of oxygen, O2, to every one of those hemoglobin molecules. So how many hemoglobin molecules did we have? 250 million. Each one can hold four so how much total oxygen for every red blood cell? One billion molecules of oxygen, right? Because 250 million times four is a billion. That's how many molecules of O2 every single red blood cell can carry. All right, now take a look here, your stem cells, your bone marrow. There are two categories of your stem cells, what they'll make. One of those is lymphatic stem cells. Where do you think lymphatic cell, stem or lymphatic cells are going to hang out? Lymph nodes. Yeah, in your lymph nodes. Good. So you have two. You have B and T lymphocytes. These are special forces. These guys help defend your body. Each one of these B and T lymphocytes is specific to one, maybe two particular antigens. Okay, they're highly, highly specific. These are like the Navy SEALs, okay, of specialization, special ops to take out a pathogen. Over here, our myeloid stem cells give rise to three things. Red blood cells, what's the job of a red blood cell? Oxygen. Oxygen. Platelets, what's the job of platelets? Clotting. Clotting. And then these are all white blood cells. 
White blood cells are like the policemen. If these are special forces, these are the policemen. Popo is still packing heat. They can still fight infections, but they are not specific like these guys, the B and T lymphocytes. And we'll be learning about this when we um, discuss the immune system. So go to white blood cells, function. What's the word you think I'm looking for there? Protect. Perfect, protects. Protects body from invasion by foreign substances and organisms. Some can be phagocytic. What do you think that means? You've learned about that word. Uh, they, 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 they can engulf, they, yeah. right. They can engulf, like you're seeing here, with this white blood cell is gonna go eat that bacteria. Um, others produce antibodies, antibodies, and others do cell-to-cell -cell combat. And others do cell-to-cell -cell combat. Our white blood cells protect us from foreign invaders, okay? as well as our own cells that go rogue. Okay, and we'll talk about that process again when we talk about the immune system. Platelets, what did you tell me platelets were for? Clotting. Clotting. Blood clotting. Now, when you have a blood clot, you don't wanna just have a random blood clot somewhere because if you just get a clot somewhere, a little um, embolism, if you have a little clot and it moves <coughs> through your body, it could go get stuck in a capillary in your brain and you could get a what? Stroke. Stroke. Exactly. So when you clot your blood, you wanna make sure you only do it exactly where you have an injury. So there's a big checks and balances where this triggers this, triggers this, triggers this, triggers this, triggers this, until you get a clot. I'm just showing you a part of it right here. When you have an injury, you will have platelets going around in this area trying to block it, but that's not gonna be enough, them crowding in this area. And when you have damaged tissue, you will have a prothrombin activator, which will convert prothrombin to thrombin, but only if you have calcium. And then that will trigger fibrinogen to become fibrin, but again, only if you have calcium. That is showing you just two steps. There are over 12 different clotting factors. If you are missing one of those clotting factors, what are you gonna have? What disease is that? Hemophilia. Hemophilia. Yeah, and your blood does not clot, and that is scary spikes. Because it's one thing if you have a cut, and it's not clotting, and you need to have that you know, stitched up. What happens if you have internal cuts? internal bruises, Your you get in a car accident, right? How do you find all the places in order to do that? So that's what makes it really scary. So the process here ultimately is you have these fibrin threads that go like spider webs whoosh, 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 all over that cut and then red blood cells go ding, 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 and they get in there and then they harden and that forms the clot. Now if this is a deep cut though, the fibrin threads are gonna go across, but be due to the hydrostatic pressure, they'll just go whoosh, whoosh. And that's when you have to apply pressure, and you might have, and that might just work to give it a chance to clot, or you might have to go get stitches or use a butterfly bandage of some sort. So this is showing you those fibrin threads and the red blood cells sticking across them. Okay, so platelets. Um, over 12 different clotting factors that work with platelets, process. Platelets at wound and with damaged tissue start enzymatic process ending with fibrin, F-I-B-R-I-N, fibrin threads forming a framework for a clot. <coughs> Hemophilia is an inherited clotting disorder, disorder caused by a deficiency in a clotting factor. Caused by a deficiency in a clotting factor. cardiovascular disorders okay. so I'm not saying not to eat a cheeseburger okay cheeseburgers are if you like meat cheeseburgers are super yummy I think okay however not all your meals why 
They're high in what kind of fat? Saturated, Saturated fat. Okay? That fat's got to go somewhere. Okay? So it might potentially clog your blood vessels. Okay? These are things known to cause problems. Okay? Being overweight, smoking, eating foods high in cholesterol, salty foods, having that be a prevalent, part, a big part of your diet. So these are things we want to be careful of. So one of the things that can happen is you can lead to high blood pressure. Okay? High blood pressure, remember we talked about this. If you have too much salt in your diet, then your blood volume is going to be bigger, so your heart's going to have to work harder. If your blood vessels are smaller, your heart is going to have to work harder. All of those things can cause high blood pressure genetically. You could be prone. If you have family members that have high blood pressure, you could be more likely to have that. And that can lead to a series of other problems. So the very first thing we want to talk about, okay, is um, anemia. hypertension is high blood pressure. High blood pressure. So that's called, what is that called again? High blood pressure, what do we call that? Hypertension. hypertension. If you have hypertension, effects of hypertension could be a heart attack. It could be a stroke. It could be kidney failure. These are all things that can happen as a result of that. It could be an aneurysm. All of these things can be a result of that. So what types of things cause that? When you have fatty buildup underneath the linings of your blood, underneath your endothelium, this fatty buildup makes the space smaller, atherosclerosis, and as a result, the heart has to work harder. Then what happens is, as the blood pressure increases, it beats against the endothelium right here, and it can tear it. If you have a tear in a blood vessel, what are you going to get? We just learned, you're gonna get a what? What do we do when we have tears in our blood vessels? We form clots. If you now get a clot because you've torn this blood vessel inside, this clot, due to the high blood pressure pushing on it that's continuing, can push the clot, loosen it, and now the clot is moving through your bloodstream. It could get stuck in your brain and you could get a stroke. Okay? All of these kind of things trigger this. So on atherosclerosis, you have plaque buildup on arterial walls, a stroke, Oh, here, let me show you this first. So sometimes they put a stent in, try to open that up a little bit. Um, a stroke is when a portion of your brain dies, either due to a blood clot or a burst blood vessel. Portion of your brain dies. Okay, here is a heart attack. It's like getting a cramp in your heart, okay? And so if you have a part of it here that's blocked, so then the heart muscle right here is not receiving the oxygen it needs, now it's going to have that cramp, okay? And that could lead to other problems as well. So you might have to get a bypass. What kind of bypass surgery is this? A triple. Do you see it? One, two, three. They've had to put in three workarounds. That's a triple bypass surgery. Okay. So on your notes where it says um, heart attack, put blood clot in coronary artery. Blood clot in coronary artery. And then right here, this would be an aneurysm, and that's when you have a ballooning of a blood vessel. Okay, so it's like that blood pressure is coming in so hard it's like stretching out that muscle so it doesn't recover as well and then that ballooning sometimes they can rupture and then all of a sudden you got blood everywhere bad yes um, this is probably a question, but, um, on heart attack how long can the heart muscle live, like, live without oxygen or before it's like dead um literally like minutes yeah and so some of those cells may never recover. And then they'll just have to be removed and then you, your heart is just less strong in that area. Yeah. Okay, now I have a series of questions. I wanna review those with you um, if we can um, during the seventh period review because I want you to go to Google Classroom so we can talk about your lab. Okay, so go to Google Classroom and um, hope this, um, you learned a bunch, have a piece of toast. <laughs>